Da Toma äh, Also äh, Ich habe sie Bogar mit schon sie I'd like to I'd like to offer my greetings to Bogar Chunsi Rinpoche, Kempo Rinpoche, and all of the other teachers in the Shadras, the students in the monks' Shadras, and in particular the students from the nuns' Shadras and especially everyone else who is watching over the webcast, I'd like to offer you my tashtile. Our, for the last month, we have had this program of teachings on the Eighth Karmapas, uh, autobiographical verses, uh, good deeds. And we're coming to a close of this program. And at first I thought I should teach it, but I thought I probably can't teach it. And the reason I thought I wouldn't be able to teach this text is that it's because the actual topic of this teaching would be very uh, difficult and um, uh, very complicated. And it also is a long time for the long duration of the teaching, I think that it's the longest teaching that I have given in my life. But for one thing, because of the uh, coronavirus epidemic, many of us are unable to travel and we have to stay at home. And so I figured that everyone would have the time. And also because of the epidemic, more people are finding that their minds are turning more towards the Dharma. And they're developing more of a wish for freedom from samsara. And so I thought I would take this opportunity and give some teachings, and I thought that this would uh, turn out well if I did so. And so, uh, today, other than we have one day tomorrow, but today we're basically completing it. But, actually I missed one day. I was originally planned to say 21 days, but I missed one. And at first I thought, maybe we should increase it by three days, but Looking at my, uh, looking at the way I'm feeling, it uh, probably wouldn't be good as a, uh, I've put so much ener energy into this that I'm not, uh, not feeling so well, so. And the doctors are telling me that I need to uh, teach. The doctors are saying that I should rest, and I'm thinking that but if I, if I keep working too hard, then I don't know if I'm going to end up in the hospital, so I think. So I've had one day less than the 21 days, but I think it's not a big difference. Next year we will continue, and I will try to do my best. Uh, today, I would. Uh, what I'd like to speak today about today is actually today. I'd rather not continue on the autobiographical versus good deeds, and the reason for this is that. We've gotten to this point of the raising bodhicitta, and if we continue with the uh, practice of training in bodhicitta, there are many different top subtopics there. And so I think that if we continue from that point next year, 
I think if we leave it at this point of the rising bodhicitta, I think it's an easier place to uh, to leave it. And because if we continue, since there are many different uh, subtalkas, so next year we won't really remember exactly where we left it off, and so. Uh, so I will not continue speaking about the autobiographical versus good deeds, but I would like to elaborate on what I said yesterday or the other day to continue on that, not to continue the discussion we began the other day. Now, during the life of the Eighth Karmapa and Mitya Dorje, we think about the great encampments, uh, earlier procedures, and the lowest performances, he basically decreased all of the pomp. And also, many people invited him to the wealthy regions of Amdo and Kham, but he did not go. Now, the people in the governments of uh, U and Sang in comparison uh, to the regions of Kham, had less faith and they had less wealth. And even in the region, it was very difficult to find any green plants growing. And no one invited Mika Jordi to these areas. No one said, please stay here. And he saw that if I stay then, in those regions, there would be less food that would be tainted by the misdeeds. and realize that there are fewer, uh, uh, fewer people who would fool him, and so he uh, uh, made the request to stay there. Now, in the region of Utsang, there are many different lords in Utsang. This is during the time of, it's during the time of the Tsangpa uh, uh, kings. Is the the end of the Rinpong uh, dynasty, in the beginning of the uh, Tsangpa uh, dynasty. And so at that time, there were many different conflicts between the various lords over power. And people trying to get him, get people onto their own side. People who are trying to uh, uh, gather followers behind them, say, to get people to say, this is my person, that's my person. And so to stay in the middle of all of them, Mikhail Dorje had to be very skilled at accommodating them all. It was not an easy thing at all. And so that was one difficulty. And also when Mikhail Dorje was staying in Utsang, He would stay in isolated places and mount retreats where most of the time there was less fighting and less problems, and so this is where he primarily stayed. And so for this reason, among his uh, entourage and uh, attendants, there were many people who thought, you know, in Kham and Kongpo, the people have a lot of faith in the Karmapa. And it's a and a country, these are regions where there's a lot of freedom. So instead of saying there, he's in Utsang, where people don't have a lot of faith and there are few offerings. And why are we staying in a place like this? If we stay in such a region, this activity can't flourish the way it would as if he stayed in other regions. And in addition to that, there's not a lot of, it doesn't have a lot of freedom. He has to always accommodate others. And so basically, he's just making difficulty for himself. He's making hard for himself. So many people thought this, and some were unable to tough it out. They weren't able to stay with the Karmapa, and they would uh, return uh, to their uh, to their own homelands. And I did mention this uh, the other day, so it's just kind of continuing the same discussion. Well, so, when we look at these uh, situations I've just described, does this mean that Mitya Dorje was just a really selfish person or really blindly stubborn in the way he did things? Someone who didn't listen to anyone? Someone who only did what he wanted or what he was interested? Is that the type of person he was?
as a, someone who really didn't take much interest in the way the uh, teachings, and in particular the kaiju teachings, di uh, flourished. It's not, uh, really. Actually, if we're going to explain this, we need to explain what his character was like from the time that he was a child. From the time he was a little child, Mikidorje was a person who stood his own two foot, just as his character. He had a really particular character. That's the way he was. He was very able to, he could hold his own ground, very independent. Also, he really wasn't anyone who listened to what other people said or thought. It is for these reasons that, for example, when he was invited by the Ming Emperor, he didn't go. Most of the people in the encampment said he should go, but Mikodorje said he wouldn't go. Even the steward, the Changzi, at that time of Mikodorje, that Changzi, the steward, Uh, said that he should go to China and uh, did various things in order to uh, get him to go. Uh, similarly, when he followed his gurus, including Sagi and Nimba Rinpoche, if he had followed the wishes of the people in the encampment, they, he wouldn't have been able to do so. But Mikha Dorje himself uh, knew that the gurus, including Sangyi Nempur and Bache, were authentic gurus, and that uh, uh, that they would be able to uh, give him all the teachings. Likewise, he realized that the Shama Chuda Yeshe was uh, was going to pass away. Otherwise, he would have uh, he would have been. Um, uh, he would have been Mikyo Dorje's uh, tutor. Likewise, during the time of Seventh Karmapa Chuda Jazo, the, the, the pomp associated with the great encampment was much greater. And so he packed it all away, and Mikyo Dorje himself decided what he wanted to do himself. Now, no one suggested that he should do this, and probably no one could have suggested them to him. Let's, who would be able to say to him, "You should uh, pack up all of the uh, all of the things of the great encampment"? No one could have said that to him. And so, for these reasons, so he was so firmly independent and a very and a very what do we say? A very hard character. He had a really particular character, and he was someone who really made firm decisions. And so. So for for that reason, at during some point, the seventh Karmapa uh, Chodichatsu had passed away, and there are many different problems that arise, and so the situation for the great encampment became very uh, came into a bad state, and so it seems like that for a time there's really a very bad time for the uh, the great encampment, but in particular. So, but then it, it gradually improved and had a great purpose. And then it was because of his kindness that many new karma comps and philosophical, co philosophical colleges that were even better than during the time of the previous compas, karma pas were established. Even in the great encampment, there was a sutra college, karma shunluk uh, ling, and a tantra called richin kaza ling. There are also 300 to 400 one-person tents for people doing meditation retreats. So these are one-person tents. There was an area set aside for people doing retreat, and they had small tents, and these were called one-person tents. And so there were uh, the, between three, 300 and 400 people who put up such one-person tents. And the people in doing these, uh, these were called the... Uh, so these retreatants... Uh, would. Uh, would uh, uh, would not s uh, they would not lie down to eat and they wouldn't sit down uh, like uh, just as we do during the three year uh, three year retreat when you go to sleep at night you sit up seated at night you wouldn't um, lie down and put your head on a pillow like a regular person sleeping and so consider there are people who do solely devoted themselves to practice and 
They had uh, their 300 and 400, 300 to 400 t uh, tents, especially for them. And also when arranging the shrines, uh, they have very elaborate uh, uh, arrangements. And particularly during the time of the... Uh, there, there are two people who are said to be emanations of uh, of Mikidorje. Mikidorje said himself, "Tupa namkatashin dabo kupa namso sital," and they started the new artistic style as the kamagari, or encampment painting, or the garluk, or encampment sculpture. And so, when we look at these reasons, we see that Mikidorje was he just a blindly stubborn person? He wasn't blindly stubborn, and not only was he not that. He was not fooled by the external aspects of the splendor. It's like as we say, like I'm, I'm attached, being attached to your father's cup. If you think if you have a cup, you say this is the, the or there's a bowl that came from my uh, father. You say that whether it's good or not, you get attached to it and you keep care, take care of it, right? He wasn't like that though. He really put his uh, energy into the upholding the actual ways of upholding the traditions of both scripture and practice and, and spreading uh, uh, Tibetan culture. He worked very hard for these purposes. And so for this reason, Mikyo Dorje, from one perspective, didn't really listen to what other people said. He, he was someone who uh, did what he thought was best. Likewise, and because he showed such independence in his active in his actions, the the tradition of the teachings he was a great very beneficial for the tradition of the teachings and uh, cultural aspects. Mikyo Dorje himself, whether it's his character or Didn't, uh, was, he was not someone who followed the old traditions. He was not someone who just followed uh, the tr blindly the old traditions of the previous masters. Instead, he he changed things for the times, and he like enjoyed uh, starting new traditions. And so, how do how can we know this? So, if we for one thing, we can look at it is by looking at his activities, and in particular, if we look at uh, text uh, called instructions for the Lord of Kurapa de, uh, and his nephews. And so what it says in this text is uh, to explain, I'm going to give the, just the meaning of it. Some people say is if this Lama doesn't follow the teachings of our uh, this Lama should follow the uh, examples of of the previous karma but he doesn't. He doesn't match the teachings of the karma of the previous, um, of the previous of the old traditional lamas or of whatever tradition. And not only he's teaching dharma that doesn't match with the uh, previous uh, previous masters, and and they say that his um, uh, and they say uh, he follows way, ways that don't fit, uh, so they must be impure. So we should not go for refuge to them. But Mikadurojide, the way he thought of it is uh, if some people say that you know, that his way of doing things is different from the, his predecessors and if it's becoming uh, doing different things, but just merely saying this does not necessarily mean that his activities were impure. And the reason is because he has to accommodate the needs and, and proclivities of sentient beings, and so the 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 and so there have to be um, infinite ways to tame all the different people who need to be tamed, and so for that reason, some some people. Uh, uh, need to. Uh, act to, in accord with their disciples and in accord with their time uh, and use their wisdom, love, and power to act in the way 
uh, in a new way to serve the teaching, this is something that actually would have a lot of faith and it's not something we should criticize him because the the activities and examples of the Lord Buddha are, are solely for the sake of uh, us benefiting sentient beings. And so they... And so you need to look at who is best at benefiting sentient beings, who is the greatest at sentient beings. We shouldn't just, instead of looking at necessarily what was done in the past, how was things were done the best, we need to look at the time and at the students. And if we look at this teaching, he said he was not someone who merely followed old traditions, he, was, he reformed things to match a new time and new students, in particular. During the time of Mikya Dorje, many people within the Kaju tradition uh, criticized Mikya Dorje for, and for because his way of describing the view was different than the way of the previous karmapas. They said it didn't match the teachings of the previous karmas, and the reason for that is that I think during the time of the third karmapa, Rishon Dorje, and the seventh karmapa, Chitta Jatso. primarily taught the teaching of the Shendong uh, view and the teachings of the third wheel of Dharma. This is what they primarily taught, what they primarily supported. That's what their, their main area was. But Mikya Dor today uh, stopped the teaching the uh, teaching the sh uh, Shentong and the um, and the teaching of the third turning the wheel of Dharma. And instead he primarily taught the wrong tongue view and for that reason Mikya Dorje he himself he taught the the wrong tongue view, in particular the Kansa constitutionalist view of especially of Chandakirti, and so many people said that this was inappropriate and wrong. Even among Mikyo Dorjide students, uh, the, they gave various different explanations of the way he explained the view. Some people said that his actual view. Uh, was the Rangtong or the self empty view. And some people said it's not actually Rangtong, that in fact it's Shentong. So there were some people who said that. So there are sort of these two different explanations. But in any case, no matter how the, exp uh, the students describe it, but in many of Mikya uh texts, he emphasized the Rangtong view. And he uh, would, and he would, and he would have made a lot of refutations of uh, Shantong teachers such as Sha uh, Chokpa and Gulotsawa. And so pe the way Mikitoto explained his view was uh, different than the way his pre uh, predecessors. Is. So this is, and that is why many people uh, said this. But that's discussion. Um, the, um, so I will speak about that so uh, topic more next year. I will not, uh, so I don't need to speak about it now. In any case, Mikya Dorjide, was not someone who was just blindly stubborn, but he actually he was something who was doing things in a way that was appropriate for his time and place. And so for this reason, if we think about And so he was really not distracted by the pomp of the encampment and so forth, and instead he really focused on the teachings of the, of the great encampment. And he also thought about the culture and the sciences and the knowledge of Tibet, and he did a lot, um, did a lot to preserve these as well. And so among these, there is the, the Kamagaji uh, style of uh, artistic style, Uh, which became a, a really special Tibetan style. So today I'd like to digress from the from his uh, uh, from Mikyo Dorje's life story and speak about the Kamagari. But generally, when we talk about painting and talk about uh, talk about the Kamagari, it's actually a very very it's a large topic, and it's something that really needs to be uh, to a lot of research. Now, I only had one day uh, to research this. 
And so there's, you can't really do a whole lot in a single day. However, to just sort of speak about it in general, uh, in general, I can speak about it in more detail next year. So today, I'll speak a little bit about, I'll give a brief introduction to, in general, to um, Tibetan arts and to the Karma Gaudi style. And tomorrow I will uh, continue with that a bit. So first of all, the Karma Gaudi or Karma Gaudi, I'd speak about the term first. Usually in the in writing we see it, this is a Gaji. So the way it speaks, the, the, he gave the Tibetan spelling there. It's often written as Gaji, but but I think it should draw in painting. I think it's better it's better to say Gaji. And the reason for this is that when you say Gaji, it means uh, encampment writing. And so it could be considered like a a new style of calligraphy or handwriting that developed in the Great Encampment. It's like so different. Oh, so there's a particular. Oh, so there's a particular handwriting style called the handwriting, and it could be, and so it can be um, confused with that. Also, between if we want to understand the difference between calligraphy and drawing, it's better to describe the encampment tradition of writing. It's better to call it garji. And better called the handwriting tradition as a gardi. And if you write that, I think it'd be good to distinguish them in that way. But whether this is logical or not is something that experts uh, should examine. I'm not saying unilaterally that it should be this. So whether we call it gardi or gardi, what it, the word particularly instincts of what we should understand it as meaning. It means because the origin of the style of drawing or painting. So the Gari style developed under the instruction and direction of the Karmapa and his heart sons by augmenting earlier Tibetan artistic techniques with techniques and styles from other uh, cultures, and so developing a new style in that way. And then with the continual support directly and indirect, and assistance of the Gyao and Karmapa and their heart sons, it spread and wildly and continued. And so that's why it is called the Garji. So these are the, so because it connected with the encampment, or the Gara became the, the Garji, or the Gara painting. So it is the, the, this artistic style that came from the, uh, from the encampment, or it is because it was uh, from the, uh, the leaders of the encampment, so it was called the for these, it was called the Gaji or the encampment painting style. So, how is it that the Tibet in Tibet there developed particular artistic styles and techniques, and how in particular did the Gaji style develop? So, generally, from the time of the first tradition transmission of the teachings in the seventh and eighth centuries. There were monasteries founded in Rasa and Pekar and Samya, Kamsa Mido, and so forth. Uh, the, so many such monasteries were founded by the Tibetan kings. Now, for these days, we can see uh, Rasa Trunang Shari in the Jakanas. If we go see, if we go in there, we can see at that time. Uh, there's a mural, and it's set, written on there. Kempo Goryesha Yang Gelon Yundin De and Kampanembe Yang drew these figures in the Dharma as merit for the king and as merit for all sentient beings. And so they wrote this there. So from that time, from the seventh and eighth centuries, there was a tradition of of painting and uh, painting and art art. And particularly these days, many scholars in Tibet Say so that the 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 jo in Lhasa, uh we often say that it was brought from uh, from China, but many modern uh, uh, scholars say examine it, saying that the Lhasa Jama was probably uh, made in Tibet itself, and so that is uh, their hypothesis. 
Likewise, in, 804, in the year 804, in Dharan and Kam, this is an old uh, Vedochina cave, and also in, in uh, Gahakid Kundo and Kam, in Bim Nambaranze, there are carvings in the caves there. Uh, that is now uh, under the care of uh, Kebji Tanga Rinpoche. So these are carvings we can still see to this day. Also during the time of the Tibetan um, Empire, the earliest signed painting by a Tibetan artist, uh, that is the time when the, there's a tradition of Tibetan artists signing their works. Now how we know this is that in the Donhong Caves there was a there is a painting on silk of the Medicine Buddha and the Thousand Arm of Lakitashvara. And the time that this was drawn was probably was probably in 800 and, uh, 836. And the person who wrote it was uh, the monk Pelyang. And this painting these days is is in the British Museum. Uh, what is written on the painting is that it's in the year of the dragon, I, the picture of Pelyong, as a service for his body, have drawn the medicine Buddha, uh, medicine Buddha Samantha Bhadra, youthful Manjushri, with thousand arm Gavlakishvara, and the wish fulfilling jewel and dedications. And so this is probably. This is probably the first time that a Tibetan artist signed his own actual works, and so we can see this work now. Now, during the time of the later transmission of the te uh, teachings, Lochen Rujin Sampo, so Lochen Rujin Sampo was born in, and born in 958, and he passed away in, uh, in 1054. So in the year 996, he built the Toling Monastery, the Korchak Monastery, Nyarma, and the Tapa Monasteries. And he wrote many different. Uh, he uh, uh, made many different monasteries. And these days, if you go to t Toling and Tolong Kapa, and there are also the Dungarasago Caves and the Wachin Caves. And so there are murals in all these places that you can still be seen to this day. So to give you a, an example, I'd like to show you the uh, the paintings at the T uh, Tuling Monastery. So these are the murals at Tuling Monastery. Some of these were drawn during the time of, some of these were probably drawn during the time of Lochinuj and Sampo, and some were probably painted later. So Tuling Tsulakhan was first bid, uh, founded in the 10th century in uh, 996. And then there was a monk called Ngushe, who was a Tertan, a very well-known Tertan. He was born. Uh, uh, he was born in uh, 1012, and in 1081, he began to build. He founded the Paldratang Monastery, and then then he he just began the construction, and then his nephews, Jungne and Jungsu. finished the construction in 1093. And so that's the Datang Monastery. And so the, and there's some of the virals of this are, are still there, and they haven't degraded, so I'd like to show them to you. So these are the murals from Datang Monastery. So these, mon so these are 11th century murals. Now, at the uh, end of the 12th century, uh, during the time of the first Karmapa, 
uh, come out. And the end of toward the end of Karma, the first Karma of his life, there was a very famous artist in, from Ga and Kam, and his name was called Jura Hachin. So now he did do some painting, but he's primarily a sculptor. Uh, he uh, he made molded sculptures. Uh, and so he made the sta- he made a very uh, a statue of the Dusum Kempa, the the seven wonders of uh, of Dusum Kempa. Now this was probably destroyed. The Karma Monastery was destroyed during the time of the. Uh, there's a, this is probably destroyed during the time of the uh, cultural religion. It's probably the the. Statues were probably destroyed, and then, uh, th- but the, um, there are remnants of these that were kept by by a woman, and then later returned to the monastery. And so, also many other uh, things that he made at the monastery, but I shall not explain them at all. Uh, I shall not explain, explain them all right now. Then, during the time of the second Karma Pakshas and I've, after uh, after twelve sixty three, there was a the. Uh, they invited um, uh, Pakshi, uh, an, an artist named Pakshi from uh, Penyu, and they built a, st- a Buddha statue called the Ornament of the World in Surpu. It was uh, 13 arm spans tall, and it was cast from copper and brass. So this was a, this was a cast statue. And so... And this is probably the largest caste statue in Tibet. However, this g- great Buddha statue from Tsurbu, they couldn't destroy it during that because uh, d- during the cultural event because it was uh, such a solid uh, uh, statue that they couldn't uh, they couldn't do it. And so they didn't destroy it then. But then during the 1970s. Uh, there was an, uh, there was a craftsman who came to the Tsurpa who realized that the the uh, Tsurpa Lhachan had been cast, and so he had made a really bad plus, and he decided that it has to had to be that it had to be burnt, and that because it was cast, if it was burnt, that it would uh, uh, that it would be destroyed by fire, and so they burnt it, and and it and it was destroyed at that time, so it would have. Uh, uh, but it, uh, it would have survived, except for this uh, person making the uh, making these plans and uh, and do. It. Now, of course, there's a lot of there are many wonder wonder stories about these sto- stories about the uh, construction of the great uh, statue and and at Surpu. Now, in the year 1306, in the 14th century, uh, the Shalu Serkang, there are the murals of from that monastery are still uh, are still extant. I'd like to show them to you as well. So these are the uh, the murals from the Shalu Monastery. So these are uh, the 14th century uh, paintings. And then from 1370 until 1425, uh, the Gyanse Pelde uh, Ch- uh, Chude Monastery was built. Uh, and this uh, had many different, uh, many different statues uh, and murals. And in for, uh, 1427, there were the, uh, the Gyanse Kubum Stupa, and there are murals there. And many statues that are still uh, that can still be seen to this day. And I'd like to show you some of the murals. And so this is uh, these are images of Dolma of Tara. Now the Johnson should uh, uh, the the artist who drew these murals. Uh, there were two famous artists who drew these murals. One was called Penjorunchen, and one was called Sunam Penjor. Penjorunchen and Sunam Peljor uh, 
were among were among the many students, uh, or excuse me, among the ten teachers of the great master Menla Dundrup. Usually, people say that he that he studied with Dropatashi uh, uh, Gyalpo, but but actually, so this is often that he studied with these. But if you look in the text that Menla Dundrup himself wrote, he mentioned um, that he studied with these two artists as his teachers. And he describes the history of this as well. Now, from the 15th time on, you could say from the 15th century on, most of the, or excuse me, up until the 15th century, most of the paintings done in Tibet were done in either an Indian or Nepali style, and primarily in Nepali styles. So if you wonder then, when did um, a particular Tibetan style of uh, art develop and the particular Tibetan uh, um, uh, techniques begin? Uh, there was a, uh, there was a, um, uh, there was a picture of Chok who was been from uh, Milk Lake in Gyaltang and Kham. And he wrote in his uh, in a text called "The Light of the Great Sun," a commentary on the presentation of the characteristics of bodily forms called the essence of goodness. And what he says here is that and the main point here he's saying. So generally in Tibet there was there was the st the style of the time of the kings that spread widely. But then not long after that, there was an uh, an emanation of Manjushri named Menla Dundrup, who was born in Mentang and Hochak. And at the time that he was born in that play, in that region, uh, there was a large deposit of vermilion. So vermilion, when you uh, when you're painting, you use a lot of vermilion, and also when you are making stamps, uh, you uh, the, uh, this is used to make the ink. It's a red it makes a red ink. So he found a great deposit there. Later, he had a wife. And so he was a layperson, he had a wife, and so he and his wife uh, didn't get along, and so he had to leave the region and go to another region for some reason. And so when he had to go, in the end he went to Tsang. And when he went to this region, this area of Tsang, this is Yuchan, and he came to a place and he found Uh, he found uh, uh, he, he found some artistic su uh, art supplies and um, things and developed an interest in art from that point. And so he wanted to go look who in the region of Tsang was a, would be a good teacher of art. And so that per that time the person would be uh, Dobotashi uh, Gyalbo. And so he studied draw uh, art from him. Not only did he draw the uh, study that. He also remembered that he, in a previous life, had been a uh, been an artist in China, and because he had been an artist, a, a Chinese artist in a previous life, and so probably, so at Chatang, uh, where at that time there was a great Chinese style drawing called uh, called the Sitang uh, drawing, and he saw that painting. And because he remembered that he remembered that he that he had been a, a Chinese artist in his previous life, immediately he was just reminded of that. And because of that, he started his own fully developed style or tradition of painting. Not only did he found this new style, he took the he took the uh, color the. He determined the, the measurements and proportions according to the Kala Chak and the Samvara Daya, the Chakra Samvara Tantra, which described the proportions and, and, uh, uh, and the different costumes and accoutrements of the different deities. And so he took these and he determined these and uh, developed the style called the Great Mentang style. Later, uh, in a dream, 
the first uh, uh, Dalai Lama had a dream that tomorrow he would meet an emanation of of, uh, of Manjushri. That next day, then Menla Dundup came to see him, and so for that reason, uh, Gyalwang Gendrudup, the first Dalai Lama, um, uh, determined that he was an emanation of Manjushri. And he also, when Gendra Trip founded a uh, temple, um, he uh, there were the paintings of the of Ajadara and of the sixteen arhats, and so Mentang wrote these uh, drew, drew these paintings then. So they are still. Uh, so they st are still there, but they've grown dark, or they've been blackened over the years, and not very clear. And you cannot really see the detail in them. You can just sort of look at it and see this kind of a shape there. They see the uh, see the form. Uh, but you can't really see the details. But uh, recently, a few years ago, there's a the tanka that says on the back that was written by uh, Menla uh, Dunwa, and this was recently found, so I would like to show it to you. And so this is written on the back of it. It's written that it's written by Menla, uh, Menla Dunwa. It's written very clearly that it was done by Menla Dunwa, so there's probably no doubt that this is uh, printed by uh, Menla Dunwa. Uh, uh, and so this was found in the Sakya Monastery. And because they found this, uh, now that this is found, we need to uh, do new research into the style and the, and the working methods of Menla Dundra. Now there's also an, another person who was had the same teacher uh, as uh, Menlan uh, and it was, it was basically one of Menlan uh companions. There was another person called Chen Sei Chenmo from Upper Gang in Gongkar. He, he and Menlan uh, Dundrup had, had the same teacher, but he had his own separate, particular um, uh, artistic style. And so for that reason, they were known as the Men and Chen traditions, so the Men Luke style and the Chen Luke styles. And so these are said to be the first two developed, particularly Tibetan artistic styles. Now, you can, there are many, um, many styles of many drawings, by, paintings by Kensei Chunwa and Pesa, and many in Lhasa, and the area of Gongkar. Uh, it was one of the most important uh, mo monasteries of the, of the Sakyas, and there, the, uh, uh, there are uh, paintings by Chen Se Chenmo that are uh, are visible there. And so these are at Gongkar uh, Dojiden uh, Gong, uh, Monastery. Uh, now there's another one that I forgot to show you, but I'll uh, uh, show you tomorrow. So when we talk about these two styles, the Menluk and the Kenluk styles, from one from Menla Dundrup, one from Kensei Chinmo. There's also someone named Tulku Chiu. So Tulku Chiu really enjoyed studying art. He was very diligent about his study. And he was always carrying uh, different paintings and various artistic supplies on, on his and he would go every, all around and he'd take a look at the nicest paintings. And uh, if there was a, a great artist, he'd study with them. And if he went someplace, um, because he went everywhere, he, they called him Chu, because he was like, which means birdie. Because the birdies fly from here to place, from one place to another. So the same place, he was called, Chulka, he was called Chu, or little bird. And called Trulkuchu, 
the reason that we say chuku doesn't mean the same as like when we usually say a chuku or a lama and chuku. Basically, most of the uh, most artists of those are called art chukus. Basically, we we have three different types of chukus. We have we have uh, we have the emanated chukus, the burnt chukus, and the and the artistic chukus. And so this is an artistic tulku, so someone who makes the uh, statues of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and paintings of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. And so this doesn't mean the same type of tulku as we usually say when we say the word uh, arning, uh, as we usually say when we mean a lama. And so he also had a particular tradition style. And so there are the three particular styles. That the, there is a menluk and the keluk styles. And in addition, there is later, there is the uh, tulku chu style. And so in general... There are many different styles, and particularly the coloration were very different, uh, were superior ways of coloring. So in general, there are many other artistic styles in Tibet, of course, but most of them, it can be uh, can be included within either the men look style or the Ken look style or the uh, Chu style. So most of these, these, the descriptions of these are are from described in the in the text I mentioned before from the picture of Rinchen Dok. And also there was a picture of Rinchen Dok who wrote about a slightly longer commentary on this. And also during the time, uh, during the time of, uh, there was a catalog of uh, written in 1697 of the offerings of the ornament of the world by uh, Lord Sanjay Jaso, and so these give the history of the uh, uh, the, uh, these give the, uh, the the main historical basis for it. So this describes how from Topo Tashi uh, Jabo he had his students Menla, um, Menla Dundrup and uh, Kensei Chenmo and they developed the two styles and that also describes how the Chu style and so these and so the Desis Asanji Jaso's texts are probably the main primary source for historians of the Men and Menlok and Kenlok styles Jason Sanyi Jatsu's uh, works, though, doesn't say even a single word about the Gajri style. He doesn't, tre- uh, he doesn't write anything about the Gajri style. And the reason he doesn't do this is not clear, but at that time, from one perspective, it was a time when, uh, when uh, there was suppression of the Karmakaju, and so the Great Encampment was probably also suppressed. Uh, it was probably uh, and all, and it could not be discussed in Marshal Gonju, the region of Marshal Gonju in, in 1673. There's a Dremu Geshe Tenzin Punsok who was born in 1673. He was very cl- uh, very skilled in medicine and astrology, and he also wrote about the techniques of coloration in a text called Giving Hues to Flowers and Bringing Out the Hundred Thousand Colors of Rainbows. And within this work, he wrote the, he gave basically the same history as the Dejin Sanjay Jatso. In 1716, he also wrote a work called Long Explanation of uh, Consecrations. And within this, what he writes is, Basically the same thing. It's the same as Dishit uh, Sanjay Jatso, but, but but basically if we think about what happened, the particular Tibetan styles that developed in Tibet itself, the first styles to develop were were those of Mentangba and Kense Chenmo. Mentangba was the first, and then second, Kense Chenmo was about the same time. And then later there was the the Tulkuchu. And so these were I think gradually there developed uh uh particular Tibetan artistic styles developed from them. Just then to speak about the development of the of the Gadri, well 
The history of the Gaudri, the earliest text to speak about the development of the Gaudri was There's an old text just found recently in Tibet called the the Light of the Great Sung in a commentary area on the presentation of the characters through the bodily forms called the Essence of Goodness. So its author was Bhikshu uh, Renchen Dupchuk from Gyatung. So he is from the region of Gyatung, and his name was Renchen Dupchuk. When he was eight or nine years old, he met uh, Karmapa Chuying Dorje. Karmapa Dorje at that time, many... Uh, many art historians who uh, research Tibetan art say that that Kamapachun Dorje was was one of the most famous artists, or one of the particular important uh, uh, Tibetan artists. Now, Kamapachun Dorje, in the latter, in the in the earlier uh, part of his life, he primarily drew, wrote in the in the Mendri style. And later in his life, he used to follow the Kashmir style and the Chinese, and, and he joined these two styles, and he mixed the two. And so uh, the 10th Karmapa Kachun Dorje had his own uh, way of drawing figures and way of uh, drawing uh, coloration. And when you see the, the works, you can know immediately that it is a uh, work by Karmapa Kachun Dorje. So it's a particular feature of his works. But Karmapa Dorje... If you say, was he a, uh, an, an artist in the uh, Gaudi style? It's hard to say that, uh, but I can speak about that tomorrow. I don't need to say it today. In any case, Gelong Richard Dutok met to come up with Chun when he was eight or nine years old. And at that time, and he and so the come up ahead uh, had him draw images of the Buddha and drawings of the 16 Arhats. And the Karmapa consecrated them and predicted that in the future he would uh, be uh, know how to draw and paint very well and would become a great artist. Then later, when he was 20 years old, uh, Rijin Dupcha, uh, the sixth Karmapa, the sixth Gyatsa, Nobu Sampo, said, there is no one else who is continuing the Gaudri style. It's very difficult to try from the Gaudri style. So... So other than someone called Tulku uh, Tulku Agonezo, so, so this is another one with it. Tulku Agonezo. Other than him, there's no one who's uh, draw, drawing in the in the Gaudi style. So you need to go to see Tulku Azo and study uh, and study uh, painting. Then Tulku Agonezo, who is that? The, the, during the there was a student of Kuncho Pende during the time of the uh, Eighth Karmapa. So Namkatashi and Kuncho Pende were both the were both contemporaries. So Kuncho Pende. Uh, now there was a student of Kenpa, uh, Kuncho Pende who was an attendant of the Sushama Shukendu who was called Epa His actual his actual name is Yanshan uh, Tripa. And he was also a very particular type of person because because he could remember seven previous lives when he could be uh, when he was an artist. In particular, in his previous life, he had been Cha Akunetsu during the time of the fifth Sharmatur. He had been a, a parrot at that time. Or sorry, and he heard many teachings uh, from the uh, for the fifth Sharmapa uh, on painting, and so for that reason, for the very uh, from the early uh, from an early age, he, he could very remember them. For that reason, he was called Tuka Aku Nezor, Aku Parrot. So he lived to the age of seventy-one. He could live to a very old age, and at that time, there was no one who really took care of him. He had a very difficult uh, time, and so when gets it. Nojin Zambu uh, gave him uh, supplies and then came and then Dunja uh, Chotrut came to him and studied um, painting with him and he spent nine months studying art with him and after that time then he didn't, con he didn't continue to study uh, with him as a teacher and the teacher passed away but basically 
in a fundamental way, he learned the, the Gaudri style. Because at that time, other than Tulka Akunadza, there was a very there wasn't anyone else drawing in the uh, the Gaudri style, and so for so the Yasa um, as a uh, Yasa Nobu Sampo sent him to study with uh, with Akunadza. Later, there was an artist named Seppa who was later who told him, "You need to write a text talking about uh, just from the style and the proportions," and so he spent seven years. Uh, so seven years later, uh, then he wrote this text called The Light of the Great Sun, a commentary on the presentation of the characteristics of uh, bodily forms called The Essence of Goodness. And he wrote it in 1704 when he was 41 years old at Surpu Monastery. Now there's the root text called The, the Essence of Goodness, as it says. Now I don't know who wrote The Essence of Goodness, what its uh, text is, we just don't know. No, this is something that we need to continue to search for. But in particular, his commentary on it gives the proportions and measurements of the Kadristan. It's the, the earliest source and the most respected source. Yeah, so this text of his is one that all the artists of the Gardas story need to research and study. Now at that time we talk about Akunezo. The thirteenth karma Bhadujana wrote in, in a text in his collected works. What it says here is says during the time of the fifth uh, consulate, there was a Nanesa who later became a monk called Akunezo, and he became known as skilled in art. So during the time of the fifth of the Kimlet there was a uh, there was there was Akunezo, a parrot. And there's a parrot, and that parrot uh, had a very nice voice. Later, uh, in the next life, he became a monk and became an artist, and so he's called, and so called a Tuku Awanezo. And so this is what he says. So, if we look at this commentary, The Light of the Great Sun, what it says is, this is quite a bit about the history of the Gaudri, and so I think it's probably okay to speak about that tomorrow. I actually better take a little bit of break, and then we'll, uh, we'll take a break, and I'll speak about this after we come back. I don't have a lot to say, just a little bit. Hola, so... I think it's probably best to begin again. So now when I showed the pictures, there's one that I made a mistake about. So I'd like to explain to it. Otherwise, and you're going to put these pictures on Facebook, and if I put up something that's mistaken, it's not good. So here, this one is a mistake. At, at Datang, it's the the lower one is actually from Shalu Monastery. Oh, so this is uh, the one I showed before, was not it? The so please put the uh, appropriate one, not the not the, if you post it. Then the lower one is the sixteen arhats. Now another thing that I said uh, described before was this one. There is the painting by Kenzi Chemo. So this is a mural at Konkara Dorje Den Monastery. He uh, did paintings of the uh, of the tantras there, but there's also a Drupal Kaiju monastery called Dalingpo, and there is a, a list of their lineage figures of the Drupal Kaiju uh, lineage. If we look at the uh, descriptions of Utsang in Kato Senge's uh, description of his travels of the uh, 
of the, of the um, it's, uh, excuse me, of, these are the lineage figures from the Ken uh, Ken uh, Ken uh, Ken So these are probably Ken Ken Chemo's own painting. They're definitely in the Ken in the Kenlo tradition. And so this is as described by Kadok Sito and Ch uh, Chigi uh, Chizunjato in his description of his travels to Utsang. So I think we're going to have some hope that these were written by Kensei Chenmo himself. Uh, but this is something that we really still have to research. So the, uh, before I was speaking about Gelon Rishin Duchok, and there's his uh, commentary, the Jolo Nimi, uh, the Great Light of the Sun. And so what it says is, now what is our own tradition? So what is writing the history in brief of the Great Encampment or Gaudi style? Rather than reading it every word to say the main points, he says, in the Kaji style, there is Chukla Namkatashi. He's the one who founded the uh, Gaji style. So Chukla Namkatashi founded the Gaji style. Chukla Namkatashi was born in the region of Yartu. When he was a young child, Mikyo Dorje said that he was his own emanations. Mikyo Dorje's own emanation, he said. And not only did he say that he was his emanation, in some way to perform the activity of his body, uh, that and so that he would have the intention of engaging in artistic activity, and that is why he uh, recognized him as as emanation. And he put him under the direction of Shema Kunjut Yenlak. So the one who gave him the direction was Shema Kunjut Yenlak. And also from A in the, there is a fortune in the eastern called Chukunchuk Pende. He was from the region of A. This region of A, now there are many artists who came from that region, uh, region, particularly many painters. Many of the greatest uh, painters from Tseng, uh, uh, from Tsang came from the region of A. So Kunchuk Pende came from the region of A. So his name was Kunchuk Pende. It is said that it is Gyasa uh, Kunchu's uh, emanation. This is in Chinese, it's called Wan Shang Kong. And so he is said to be a, uh, an emanation of Gyasa Kunchu. So Shama Kunchu uh, 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 directed Tulku Namakatashi and Ebu Tulku, or it was put under the instruction of Gyatsab Drapa Dundrup, and these two together used the, the, the Indian Lima, or the, the Indian uh, traditions of paintings in the previous Tibetan uh, Mentang uh, tradition. They took these two traditions as their basis, and they used the, the, the land strikes or the coloration of the region of, of Sintang during the time of the King Ming emperors. Now, during the time of the fifth Karmapa, the Chinese Emperor Yongle, there are many, uh, and, he, and at that time there were all the wondrous events, and at that time uh, they, these were drawn in paintings. And as I should just, there are two, two copies of this, uh, of this painting. One was kept by the Emperor himself, and was kept by, it was given to the uh, to the Karmapa, and that was given to the uh, Monastery of Tsurpo, and that is still extant today. And that shows the Ming, and so they used these style of painting from from Chinese uh, from China, and they, for, uh, they used that to make this, this particular uh, Gaudi style of painting. Likewise, there is the an expert sculptor, not just painting, but a sculptor. Who was called Kama Sidr, was called Crazy Go. And so his name was, this is, 
uh, this is this called from Paul Boa, who was uh, a student of Karma Sidra Lucchese Go. And he, this uh, Paul, Paul Boa was also said to be an emanation of Eth Karmapa. So this is a tradition of uh, of uh, sculpture. And so there are many other people called Karma Rinchen and other people who were expert in this style. But at the time of Kelong Rinchen uh, Chotrup, this, this style of sculpting had already disappeared. And so there's not a lot the, the, that at that time there was not a lot of it left to be seen. So if we look at this historical document of his, we see that the, the Kamargaji style of painting, we often say that it's uh, Toko Namkatashi is the one who started it, but it's actually Namkatashi was primarily Namkatashi, but together with him there was the the Elk Elpa Epa Trukupende as well, who worked with him and who worked did a lot of work with him. So prim primarily these two figures, so these two personages who uh farmed the style. So I think they should both be credited as the founders of the style. And in later times this in modern times, this main source that people use as a source on the Kamargaji style is uh the sta the description about the uh, sources as the uh, treasury of knowledge by Chamakanto Lodotai. What he says is there's the Tulka Kavatashi from Yatra. Mikyo Doji said he was his own emanation, would propagate art his artistic activity. With instruction from the uh, Kuncha Yenlak and Jata Panjadunda, the fortunate Easterner uh, Kuncha Bende from A studied the Menluk style from Gyamo Sakonjo's emanation. Using the proportions from the Indian Lima and Mentang traditions as a basis, and drawing landscapes with the coloration like the Sitang from the time of the of the Ming emperors, this became known as the Gaji style. So this is what is uh, most commonly said. But I think that the, the statement from uh, Rinchen Choktrup is actually a bit slower. So the 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 founders of this was uh, Namkatashi, as is well known, but. But if we look at a Russian Dutch, it says this, Yadetulku Pende was also a very important figure in the development of the Kamagari style. So tomorrow, I'll speak a little bit about Namkatashi and Tulku Pende. And the development and uh, the development and decline of the Gaudi style. Actually, today we haven't had a lot of time. So, for one perspective, or from one aspect, I haven't had a lot of time to do research, and I haven't got a lot of time to speak. And so, today I've only been able to speak about this in brief. But next year, I hope that I can speak in more detail about the topic of the Gaudi style. These days, of course, there are many people who, still, who uh, paint in the Gaudi style in Tibet. However, but most of them but there are many but even so there are many still many blank areas in the history of the Kamagadri style. So I think it's important to sort of clarify the topic of the Gaudi style. And identify what was a pretty, the uh, in original got a style of painting and, and proportions and so forth. What the differences between the original style and the modern styles? And I think it's important for us to research these differences. And the reason for that is, I look at this. The the Gaudi st style is still present, of course, but. But in order to bring out its uh, its new features and its, uh, and I have the feeling that we haven't done enough to bring out its particular features, and so I think I'd like to speak about that a little bit tomorrow. In particular, I'd like to speak about, I'd like to show you a few of the paintings by the tenth Karma Bhutri in Dorje. In addition, another thing that's gone well this year is it. Uh, there is an. Uh, uh, I recently received a biography of the Karmapatra in Dorje from by his own dis, uh, by his own attendant, and so this has a, 
uh, uh, very long explanations of the artistic activities of Karma Karma Bachu and Dorje. And so I'd like to uh, introduce that to you. But I don't know if I, there's not a whole lot of time, so so I won't be able to say everything tomorrow. And in particular tomorrow, we have the text. Text and I have I've decided yesterday what we're going. I've decided what we'll do it about the. Do the I thought we would do the, the Gurutso, The now, if you might think that we're doing the Gurutso, but actually we won't do such a long one. The first person to start the the ocean of songs, the reign of wisdom. So this is uh, started by Mikio Dorje, and so he started the basic the framework for the the Gurutso. This is written by song. So the framework for we'll take the framework written by Mikio Dorje. And then include, include within the, so, the songs by Marpa, Milarepa, and, and Gampopa. But we don't need to recite the other songs, and that's what we'll do tomorrow. And I'm not, I don't have a, uh, the Shata hat to wear. And so the main person to, rec, uh, to recite it will be the, will be the Palmuchade from, from Bhutan. And so because we're doing it over the internet, I think it's best if we actually record it first, because otherwise, The if, the if the internet connection is not good enough, then not sometimes it, uh, the it, uh, the connection gets broken, and so it's best to record it, and then we can recite along with it. And so that is how it is.